being resourceful is simply having an ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome obstacles. People are probably not motivated to do things unless it is something that is functional and meaningful to them. Welcome to Unleashed. I'm Colleen Pilar, a dog trainer fascinated by people. Dogs bring out the best in us. Your dog thinks you're awesome because you are kind, thoughtful, generous, playful. In each episode of Unleashed, I'll choose one behavior trait that dogs and people share and interview a fascinating person to talk about how that trait appears in dogs and in people. Then we'll explore ways that you can more fully embody the trait so that you can show up at work and at home as the amazing person your dog knows you to be. Are you ready to be unleashed? Hi, welcome to Unleashed. My guest today is Melissa Winkle, an occupational therapist and dog trainer in private practice in New Mexico. And one very interesting thing about Melissa is that she uses animals in her work in occupational therapy. So we're going to be talking to her today about resourcefulness and ways that we can become more resourceful ourselves. Welcome, Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you could join us today. So can you tell us a little bit about how you use dogs in your work? Well, I'm very fortunate that I have been in practice for 17 years, and I have never been in practice without a dog. My career sort of started in, um, you know, way back a long time ago, working in grooming shops and boarding facilities and pet supply stores, um, and then working for a veterinarian. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, which... I thought might be veterinarian. Um, but the problem is people um, did not take care of their dogs as well as I had hoped they would, and they would make poor decisions. So I started looking for something in the human field, stumbled upon occupational therapy, which is ironic because I love the resourcefulness of occupational mm-hmm. therapy with disabilities. And then um, and so I went through school And our last semester, we had to do a community health project and infuse occupational therapy into an area that had not been done before, and I chose assistance dogs. So working with assistance dogs was a resourceful way um, for assistive technology options, and um, a dog, you know, could provide a little bit of mobility. It could also provide some um, retrieval skills and, you know, even some seizure alert or response. So it seemed like a, a sure thing. So I ended up applying for a dog and, um, the organizations kind of giggled and they said, Oh, you mean a therapy dog? And I said, not exactly. I'm more interested in the assistive technology piece. So I was placed with an assistance dog um, that also worked in my practice. And so I went on to develop some um, evaluations and things like that for people with disabilities and then started developing animal assisted therapy. An occupational therapist works with people with physical, cognitive, or psychiatric disabilities. And one of the cool things is that dogs work really well with people with disabilities Mm -hmm. and they play so many fun games. (laughs) And even the act of training a dog requires physical, cognitive, and psychiatric work. Yes, absolutely. And do you work mostly with children? Most of what I've seen from your work is with children. Is that true of your whole practice? I would say that 70% of what I do is kids aged 3 to 18, and then the rest would be adults, um, veterans, people coming in that want to do self-training for assistance dogs or things like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, the whole concept of occupational therapy is a very interesting field to me. I have an aunt who broke her shoulder severely, shattered her shoulder in June, and has had surgery, complete shoulder replacement, and that went okay. And she's been doing physical therapy, but some of the very specific suggestions that an occupational therapist has made for her have been really good quality of life issues, um, improving in some of those areas. And it is... Just a different way of thinking about problems, I think. You know, sort of looking at things from another angle. 
It is. And, you know, occupational therapists really focus on what is meaningful to people. Um, I think that people are probably not motivated to do things unless it is something that is functional and meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it could be that somebody has been in a car accident and they want to be able to take their dog for a walk. And, um, Perhaps they have a traumatic brain injury and their hands don't work the way that they used to. An occupational therapist would come in and look at some different kind of leash fasteners or alternatives or different ways of uh, manipulating for fine motor skills, all of that kind of stuff. Cool. So the trait of resourcefulness, how do you see that in the dogs themselves? When do you see dogs being resourceful? Well, so let's back up and just remind everybody that Being resourceful is simply having an ability to find sort of quick and clever ways to overcome obstacles. You have to be enterprising and creative and clever and be able to look at things in a different way. So some of the fun things that that I've heard of dogs doing are really kind of cool. There was this one story about this dog after Hurricane Katrina and there was this dog walking down the street with this huge bag of dog food. And this is in the aftermath of the storm. So it was really interesting. There was this one person who ended up following this dog, you know, through all this water and the dog did end up getting home with this big bag of dog food. And it was at a time where all of the humans were trying to figure out what are our resources (laughs) How can we be resourceful? And then you see this dog that has somehow looted dog food. They don't know where the dog food came from. And he took it all the way home. Smart dog. It is very smart. And in another case, it's really cute. There's a a YouTube video where this little terrier is jumping at a gate and he's stuck in the kitchen and he can't get into the living room. And he's just barking his little face off. And then he disappears and he comes back with this plastic step stool on his back. And puts it right in front of the gate. Now, the thing is, I thought, you know, he could have disappeared off camera and somebody could have put that little thing on him. He could have been trained for that. But the little dog, he walks over to the gate, puts it down at kind of just the right place, can barely jump up on this step stool. And then he gets on the step stool and then jumps over the gate to get to the thing that he wanted before. Mm -hmm. And in that case, they were absolutely resourceful. Even if he was trained to do that, he knew when to use it. Right. Right. My brother-in-law was saying recently that he wished he had video on their previous dog, who's no longer alive, of how he could get in the garbage. Because the family spent many, many hours finding ways to jury-rig garbage traps so that the cabinet would not open and the garbage could not be gotten at. And pretty much Presto could get through all of them because he was very, very smart and he had the time to do it. So he was like, let me think about that. Let me find the way. Yeah, well, you know, it is, it's very cute, especially when it comes to getting some of the bare necessities. I know that there are some, some stray dogs in Russia that learned how to use the subway to travel to areas that had more restaurants or more food stands where they could scavenge and even scare people for food. Mm -hmm. They would growl and bark at people. The people would drop the food and run or throw their sandwich, whatever. Um, And it's also really interesting because, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, there are people that, get dogs and end up realizing that that probably wasn't a good idea and they end up ditching the dogs Mm -hmm. and um, you know so now we've got this domesticated dog out in the wild and dogs become very resourceful in figuring out hey let's go into this man-made building for shelter from the rain or even knowing where to go to find some of the food and scraps and things like that that are left around Mm mm-hmm And people are very resourceful ourselves. We are definitely a resourceful species. What are the benefits of resourcefulness for us? How does that help us? It's interesting because being resourceful, I think, has a lot of links to being opportunistic. Um, I think having resourcefulness also lends itself to just survival, you know, just being able to figure out what we're going to do to get the things that we need or to get to the places that we want to go or, you know, to be able to do the things that we need to do in in very clever ways. If you think about the resourcefulness of some of the orphans in other countries that run around and clean windows of Americans um, and they dilute down their cleaning products and they clean the windows 
straight away without asking. That's very resourceful because then they know that people are more likely to pay because this service has been mm-hmm. offered. And then they can go and get food and provide for their families and do things like that. And there are other times that, you know, it's not necessarily out of necessity, but let's think about um, the ban in New York subways when people weren't allowed to take their pets on unless their dogs were in some sort of a container. And so you would see people with Ikea bags, these huge bags, Mm -hmm. and they would have four holes in them so their dog's legs could fit through. And then they're walking their dog in a bag. So the dog's legs are hanging out of the bag, but the dog is still contained. So it's, it's very interesting how resourceful people can do. Like I said, sometimes it's for survival and sometimes it's just kind of funny. Mm hmm. It's also interesting, the difference in connotation, because if you say, oh, she's very resourceful, that sounds good. And if you say, oh, she's very opportunistic, Uh many of us will take that badly. But it really is very much the same thing. I mean, it's seeing what's there and how can I use it. And we have different tations on these words. It's true. And it's unfortunate sometimes that, um, that, that it is seen negatively, because being opportunistic or being scrappy or inventive or enterprising. These are all amazing skills. Most of the people that I know who are flourishing in their careers had to overcome some sort of difficulties. They had to learn how to see an opportunity and take advantage of it. And in order to see that opportunity, you have to have very, very flexible thinking patterns and really incredible observation skills. If you are hiring a new dog trainer or hiring a new occupational therapist, you want to ask if they're resourceful because if they are, it means that they're good at problem solving and that can come in very handy. If we're talking about a person with a disability that comes into the clinic that doesn't have great use of their arms, but they want to be able to give their dog a treat, then the OT would come in and say, hey, we've got some of this really great specialized equipment, buttons, switches, phone applications, and all of that kind of stuff. And if the same dog trainer were put in that situation, they'd say, hey, let's look at some different ways and how we can get your dog to do the thing that they're doing mm-hmm. or that you want them to do. We have to be really careful because there's such a difference between somebody who is full of resources versus resourcefulness. Those are two very different things. Somebody may know a lot of places to go and get information or to get help. And those can be a great aspect of resourcefulness. But the resourceful person is going to look and say, okay, here's what I've got and kind of treat it in a MacGyver situation. Yeah. Here's what I've got. What can I make out of it? Mm-hmm. That's a very good distinction. Do you think that kind of creative thinking can be taught? Or do you think it's something that people just have? I think that it is a gift that a lot of people have. But I think that for many people, it it can be learned. A lot of it, like I said, is observations. We have a little game that we play here in my clinic every time I get a new intern or somebody coming in for a post-professional rotation. And, you know, I'm always telling people you've got to see people, dogs, and things for what they can be, not necessarily for what you just see in front of you. Mm -hmm. Frame your thinking and say, let's see what this much bigger picture is. And so we play a little game that I'd like to play with you if you don't mind. Okay, I will be game for this. In my hand, I have a typical ballpoint pen. Yes. And so let's talk about all of the ways that we can use this pen in either working with a person with a disability, or training a dog. So the first thing that comes to my mind, if I'm working with a person with a disability, I can put this on the floor and have them step over it so I can work on their hip flexion. Mm -hmm. What could you train a dog for with this? I could train a dog to walk up to the pen and stop, like use it as a marker, a a place. I love this. So I want to take a shot at a dog part now. So I could also take this ballpoint pen and use it as a clicker. Mm -hmm. How could you work with this pen with a human being um, in order to make maybe their eyes work or their hands work better? 
to make their eyes work better, I might be able to use it as a tracking, you know, watch the exactly. pen. Make Perfect. their hands work better, something similar where you could reach toward it. Or even if we were talking about um, different placements within your fingers, could you hold it the way we would hold a pencil to write? Or could you grasp it in your fist? Those kinds of things, different positions. Exactly. And these are examples of being resourceful. All we have is this ballpoint pen and you and I can train a dog or work with a person with a disability to make their dreams come true. Cool. So it really is a matter of looking at what you've got just right here in front of you and finding a way to help somebody improve in an area that they're, they're trying to improve. Exactly. So I, I recall a video that you showed at a conference once. I, I, I am not an occupational therapist, so I probably have all the muscles and things wrong. But as I recall this video, it was a child who was um, trying to work on body control and rotation. If I'm remembering right, it was a boy. He was lying on the floor, lean back and get a dog treat and then bring it to the front where the dog was in front of him and deliver the treat. So it yes. was like developing his core and his control of his torso. Yes. Did that just come to you in a moment? Do you, are you always playing with like, oh, if I want you to reach over here, I just move dog treats over here because you can reach that way to feed my dog or dog? Exactly. <laughs> or moving things out of their line of vision. So they have to use kinesthesia, which is kind of moving your body and feeling for something behind you. Mm -hmm. Or stereognosis, being able to find a certain shaped treat in the bowl, an X, an O, a Cheerio, things like that. Um, those kind of ideas come to me all the time. And so I publish them, <laughs> <laughs> publish a lot of books um, that involve dog training and animal assisted therapy. And, you know, in, in that exact case that you're talking about, we can have somebody on the floor and they're doing sit-ups, or if it's a kid, we call them sit pups, um, where the dog is sitting sort of in between their legs, they reach behind themselves while they're laying down, get a treat, come up, get eye contact, say yes, and give the dog a treat. And I can get somebody to do 30 sit-ups versus, you know, having them just do sit-ups. Yeah. Um, I can also be resourceful and say, okay, I need to work on even more back extension or abdominal flexion, and I can sit them on a therapy ball and have them do the same exact activity that way so that they're leaning a little bit further over or potentially getting inverted. I have them in lots of different positions on that ball. Every time a bathroom rug comes out, I can put it down anywhere in a room and my dog knows that the games are going to begin. If my dog goes to that mat, they, I know that they want to participate. If my dog goes to the door, I know they don't want to participate and so I let a different dog in. So it's really kind of cool because depending upon where I place that mat or how I position my client, both dog and client are going to have a whole lot of fun doing an occupational therapy activity. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm thinking I should be doing sit-ups with my dog because <laughs> I sure would do a lot more if it was something we were both winning at as opposed to me just feeling sorry for myself doing sit-ups. What do you think the challenges are for people in terms of, of being resourceful? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. There are actually some key elements that people should have or learn in order to become resourceful. So if we talk about that, then I think it'll help people to prepare. I think that rule breakers or rule benders end up bending the rules. I mean, and we're, we, we don't want everybody breaking all the rules, but if somebody bends the rules or pushes boundaries a tiny bit, then they end up being a little more creative. They end up kind of cultivating an attitude that they're going to accomplish something and not just go with how things have always been done. Mm -hmm. And so they're a little more willing to be creative and look outside of the box and move outside of that box. I think they also look for um, common ground. And usually somebody else is benefiting. I think that's something really common that I see in all of my friends, family, or colleagues. The motivation in humans is usually for somebody else. It can be a motivation for getting something for yourself, such as the orphans trying to get money for food. But, you know, here in, in, in our 
country. I think that we do a lot of things and we get resourceful to help other people. We look for that common good. We don't apologize. Think about that saying, it's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission. Yes. The thing is to make sure that that when we're bending those rules and asking for forgiveness, that it's not a really big thing. That outcome has to really be worth it in order to bend rules and, and apologize for it. Um, you know, I think that people also can adapt and take information they've learned in one situation and really apply it to another one, much the way that I do um, in my occupational therapy practice, as well as training dogs. You know, it's all really about learning theory, finding out what motivates either species, and then, you know, figuring out how to make things happen. But I, I think we also have more than one thing going on at a time. We always have multiple plans. If you think about a dog trainer or an occupational therapist, we know that we might be doing clicker training with a dog or tag teach with a human. Let's say I'm teaching a kid to tie their shoes. I'm going to backward chain and tag them Mm -hmm. um, for every step that they get correct. And if that doesn't work, I know that I can go through and do something in a different direction. I can shape things. I can capture behavior in dogs or kids. I can do all kinds of different things. But I think we also have the ability to just ask for for what we need. What is it that we need to make this thing happen? And I think that the resourceful people are more willing to take those chances because they are kind of the rule benders, the boundary bumpers, that kind of thing. I think that last one, the asking for what we need, at least for me, is a big stumbling block, you know, because so many of us were raised with you should help others, but you should not ever ask for help. (laughs) You know, like asking for help is bad and it's a sign of weakness and you should just figure it out on your own. The more I'm learning to ask for what I need, the more I'm seeing the benefits of doing so. It it does expand in so many different ways. And it gives you that ability, like you said, about adapting information. Because by asking for something, you're getting a new input and a new insight into how something could be done as opposed to your own limited view. But for me, I would say, and for many people I know, the asking for what I need is the most difficult part of, of the key elements you just described. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. And I think if we can all learn how to um, develop our skills and, you know, anticipate any problems that might come up or change how we're thinking about a situation, if we can look at things differently. And really when it comes to solving problems, there are a lot of things we can do for ourselves. There are a lot of things that are solutions already out there. We just have to learn to recognize them. And I think, you know, along with learning how to ask for help, you need to be willing to learn from watching others or from watching ourselves make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That is some of the best learning ever. I try not to apologize for making mistakes. And, you know, there are some having kids and dogs in a practice. I'm just asking for it. (laughs) The things do not go right. There are going to be times that. Um, it's difficult to even hit my own standards, you know, standards of practice mm-hmm. and things go wrong. Things go wrong with dogs, things go wrong with kids and things go wrong with both of them together. But I, I love my mistakes. I try to use them as a learning opportunity for both the kids, parents, um, staff and interns that come into the practice. And I just don't think that that's something that we should feel bad about. I mean, it it hurts initially making a mistake, especially the ones where you're like, oh, I knew better and I saw it coming and I still did it. But that is a big part of resourcefulness, saying how can I apply this and be better prepared next time? Right. We can't deny ourselves that, that kind of information. And we have to also not forget the obvious. Since you are working with people who are working on very specific goals, What do you do to encourage them to both ask for what they need and kind of love their mistakes? Well, you know, number one, you've got to find out what motivates people. I may have a hidden agenda of somebody 
showering, let's say an adult or a teenager with a developmental disability that just doesn't understand that showering is important, and now I know that that's leading into them having poor social skills because nobody wants to be around them because they're kind of stinky, their clothes are dirty, they have food all over, etc., etc. But let's say the only thing that really motivates that person is animals, working with the dogs. People always say, oh, I'm going to dog therapy. People have no idea what they come to dog wood for. <laughs> That's they come for dog therapy or dog training or whatever they end up calling it. And one of the things that I can do is if I'm doing a little bit of scent training and I explain to them that dogs have very amazing um, scent ability and that we don't want to disrupt the dog's learning, the chances are really good that that client is going to shower before they come in. And if they do that, then I can drop that client into a pair or a group with another person of similar skill level um, so that they can make friends and learn how to do teamwork and figure out, hey, we have this thing in common. And so now I'm able to get them to shower. I'm able to work on their social skills by just having them in the same situation because they happen to both love dogs. Our dogs great? They bring us all together. <laughs> they are amazing. They just are. So how many dogs do you currently have? I currently have five dogs in my practice, and um, the oldest is Gertrude. She is seven and a half years old, and um, I have Widgie, who is about five years old. Woody is four, gigantic Labradoodle, and um, then we have Lucy, who is a mini Labradoodle, and the newest member to the family, and to um, the practice is Clementine. She is just now turning eight months old. She is a beautiful yellow lab, and I have to say she is one of the most resourceful dogs I know. Oh, yeah? She is a dog that can tug um, a placemat or a tablecloth to bring a plate closer to the edge of the table. <laughs> and she is currently learning how to play the drums and the electric guitar. So, um, those are very, very fun. She's very resourceful with that. Um, if I want her to target a very specific button or the whammy bar on her base, then um, and she doesn't know what I'm doing, then she will say, I have no idea what you're asking me to do, but I do know how to do this. <laughs> she gets resourceful by offering a lot of behavior because she knows I'm going to give her a treat for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a video you can share of her learning something? I yes, we are taping this weekend, uh, or I'm sorry, the rest of this week, um, with her learning how to do that, as well as have you do you remember the game Kerplunk, where there's a tall cylinder and you put in lots of pickup sticks, mm -hmm. they're plastic, yes, marbles. So we load dog treats in the top, and then I can pull a stick, or one of my clients can pull a stick, and then we're teaching Clementine to grab a stick and pull. Oh. She gets to have. One of her little dog treats that falls out. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. So we, we train the dogs for all kinds of really cool stuff here. And, you know, the other thing that's really important to know is that I see a lot more resourcefulness and creativity with my dogs if they get to pick their caseload. So Woody has a very specific caseload. He likes um, individuals with autism and multiple disabilities, people that rock and flap and have involuntary vocalization. He just gets them. And when he walks in a room, all of that stops, and they just are mesmerized with him. Gertie is um, somebody who does really well with people who want who have to do stretching, strengthening, or a lot of activity because she does freestyle dancing, and she's an expert at doga and, um, you know, leg weaves and agility and all that kind of stuff. So every dog in the practice has their own favorite type of person, age of person, and that can change over time. Mm -hmm. um, as they get older, they, they tend to say, hey, how about I not be with the seven and eight-year-olds and let's move me into the teens or something like that. So um, we can get very, very creative because the dogs are always learning new activities, whether I'm teaching them or not. <laughs> something new is always yes. happening here. <laughs> And, you know, all of our supplies, every single item in this clinic can be used for occupational therapy or for dog training. So it's a very resourceful clinic when it comes to purchasing all of our supplies. Yes, I bet. Yeah, I haven't thought about the game Kerplunk in a million years, and there you are well, utilizing it. <laughs> that's right. We'll send you some videos. That would be amazing. I would just like to go back one more time on how we can be more resourceful. What's one thing that you could do to to get 
better at that? I mean, would you say it's kind of the pen game, exploring as many yes. ways to, okay. Absolutely. Or a wooden spoon or, you know, really, truly, if if it's still available, going online and watching old cases of MacGyver, just watching <laughs> somebody else be resourceful and say, I'm going to turn this aluminum foil and this ballpoint pen into an antenna. I think that that can absolutely help. Yeah, the whole MacGyver thing is is kind of funny with all the things. Like, he had nothing, and then it would work. So I'm, I'm going to go off on a tangent here because the best MacGyver story I ever heard, I heard from Patricia McConnell. And I can't remember. You might have even been there at this time when she was talking about on a safari in Africa where they were going out on safari with two Jeeps, and they were in radio contact with one another. And Jeep number one got far enough ahead that um, – they couldn't see them anymore, and she was in Jeep number two, and the the guide, whose name I can recall because she described him so funny, um, Tico McNutt, was, is pointing things out. So Tico McNutt points out a hippo femur that they just drive by. Look, there's a hippo femur, and everybody on the safari is like, oh, interesting, fascinating. And then they drive down into a rut and break their axle. So there they are with a broken axle just somewhere and they're out of radio contact from the other jeep because they're now in a rut and the other jeep is too far ahead tico mcnutt says go back and get the hippo femur and everybody give me your shoelaces so everybody takes off their shoelaces and he goes under the jeep and he uses shoelaces and the hippo femur to support the axle to give it enough stability that they can get up out of the rut and far enough forward that they can get into radio contact with the other jeep and i was like if anyone else told me the story i wouldn't believe it but patricia mcconnell she's just you know she's just so honest and sincere she's like no i i promise i swear this happened i'm like i don't know the the shoelace and hippo femur that's very macgyverish you know? she's like i swear so but that's resourcefulness that's like such an excellent example of taking what's yeah, there yeah yeah it's amazing well and you know you think about like a lot of these kiddos that are born without arms and they learn how to feed themselves and write with their feet mm-hmm. and do all of those things. And it's not even necessarily something that's taught. It just happens because there is no other option. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when there is no other option, we've got to find a way. So since you have five dogs, I'm going to, I'm going to just ask about Gertie. But if Gertie could talk, how would she describe you? <laughs> um. Gertie would describe me as bold. Um, Nobody ever has to guess what I'm thinking. I say what's on my mind, and I don't mean to be mean. I just say what's happening or make recommendations or things like that. Um, She would also say that I am always really concerned about making sure that both clients and dogs in my practice are happy. I really, truly want everybody to be happy and the one thing that makes me grumpy is when things are not going well for clients or dogs and um i take it very very personally even if i'm not the one causing the discomfort um it it means that somebody in my clinic right is that is representing me or my clinic is not doing well with something and that's really tricky but i think that's probably i think she would also describe me as very creative um you know given the amount of activities that we do and activities that we make up on a daily basis i mean it's it is so much that i just can't even publish them all anymore because (laughs) it just you just get in this groove and if one thing doesn't work then you just start changing little components i wake up in the middle of the night with all these amazing ideas and things like that and um so she would describe me as as those things. That's a that's a lovely description. That's a wonderful description. So if listeners wanted to learn more about you and about the programs that you have, how could they do that? Well, they can go on the internet and go to www.dogwoodtherapy.com. They can also go on Amazon and type in Melissa Winkle and all of my books will come up. There's a number of books in there that are based on animal-assisted therapy, and um, those books go through and talk about, here's 
all of the cool things that it'll work on with clients, this activity, here's the supplies you need, here are precautions. And then at the bottom of the page, it says, it's a little anthropomorphic. It says, here's what your dog is thinking about. And so what we tried to do, what Gertie tried to do, (laughs) was look at the therapy ball activity and say, wow, dogs could really be afraid of therapy balls. And wow, dogs could really be freaked out by somebody in an inverted position. Mm -hmm. And so... She lists the things that dogs can be afraid of, and then those are then relisted as skills that the dog should learn before they participate. So it's a good dog training book um, for people who are helping to train dogs for animal-assisted interventions of any kind, and it's also a great um, animal-assisted therapy book for healthcare, human service providers, and educators to use in their own educational or healthcare practices, working with dogs Perfect. and disabilities. And I'll make sure to have the links for those in the show notes. I appreciate that. Thanks so much for coming on to talk about resourcefulness today. This was a really fun conversation. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. It's really a treat. So what do you think? Are you ready to be unleashed? Ready to open up and fully become the amazing person your dog knows you to be? Subscribe to Unleashed. And please visit ColleenPilar.com slash iTunes to leave a review. It helps new listeners find us. And my dog gets an extra treat for each new review. Say thank you, Edzo.